Good morning, uh, my name's David. I'm one of the ministers at St Catherine's Church at Eton and it's a pleasure to be with you this morning as we gather for just a short uh, time of BCP morning prayer. We're going to have time to pray together and there's going to be a short reflection on Palm Sunday and we're even going to have a song at the end and all the words you need are going to appear on the left hand side here, the left hand side of the screen. The words that are in bold I'll invite you to join in with if you would. Uh, sometimes I won't join in with them, I'll leave space for you at home to join in if that's appropriate. I'd like to begin before we start with a verse that's been mulling around in my head for the last few weeks as we work out what we're going to be doing with church, whatever that is, over the next days, weeks and months ahead. And it's from Hebrews 10 and we're going to look at verse 23 and this is what it says. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So there's two things for me there. There's holding on to the hope that we profess, that Jesus Christ is King. He is Lord of Lords. He is seated on the throne. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the firstborn from among the dead. And we hold that and then that leads us to, to want to be together and to worship and pray. And I know it's not the same uh, watching me through a screen and it's not the same for me. I'm not with you, my friends. But, but I hope that this in some way allows us to, to fulfil that, that call from the writer of the Hebrews to not give up meeting together. So well done for finding us on YouTube. Um, and we'll be making a start with all the words you need on the left of the screen. So I'll say a few words to draw us to confess and to pray to God. So my dearly beloved brethren, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sin and wickedness uh, and not that we should disassemble nor cloak them before the face of almighty God, our heavenly father, but that we should confess them with a hope, with a humble, lowly, penitent and obedient heart to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, yet all we most chiefly so to do when we assemble and meet together, either in the flesh or online, to render thanks for the great benefit that we've received at his hands, to set forth his most holy praise, to hear his most holy word and to ask those things which are requisite just for the body and as for the soul. So wherefore I pray and beseech you, as many as are watching with me, to accompany me with a pure heart and a humble voice unto the throne of heavenly grace. So let's say this prayer together. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws and we have left undone those things which we ought to have done and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders, Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. So, Lord, we beseech thee, absolve thy people from their offences, that through thy bountiful goodness we may all be delivered from the bands of those sins, which by our frailty we have committed. Grant this, our Heavenly Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our blessed Lord and Saviour. Amen. And we pray together as forgiven people. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not to temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory for ever and ever amen 
So if you could join in with the words in bold here, I'll leave a, leave a space for you to do so. O oh Lord, open thou our lips. O oh God, make speed to save us. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. Praise ye the Lord. Let's praise him together with the words of the Venite. Let's say together, O oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are all the corners of the earth and the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his and he made it and his hands prepared the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and fall down and kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is the Lord our God. We are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me and saw my works. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, It is the people that do err in their hearts, for they have not known my ways, unto whom I swore in my wrath that they should not enter my rest. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. I'm going to invite Rosemary to bring us our Old Testament Bible reading now. Over to you, Rosemary. The Old Testament reading is taken from Zechariah chapter 9, beginning at the ninth verse. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bow will be broken and he will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the Euphrates to the ends of the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now over to Kimberly, who's going to bring us our New Testament reading. The New Testament reading is taken from Luke chapter 19, verses 28 to 40. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a cult tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near to the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Okay. Uh, should we pray before we see what God might want to say to us through those readings? So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word changes lives, that it's your inspired word to us. So today we pray, Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you come and speak to us and challenge us that we might be better disciples of yours? In Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder if you've ever been on a, on a long journey. 
Uh, maybe it's been a flight to another country. Maybe it's been one of those long drives that's gone on and on and on. You know, you get to another service station and you think, oh, I'm nearly there and you've got hours to go. Um, before we had children, Kim and I used to love going on holiday abroad to places a long way away that was totally different. The logistics now make that a bit difficult. And in today's season of corona, um, it's impossible, isn't it? But there's something exciting about going on a journey. And I don't know about you, but but the most exciting bit for me is the end of the journey. It might be with the aeroplane, it is coming into land and you're looking down. It might be as you're driving along the M54 and you see the Rekin in the distance. And in our reading today, we hear of Jesus too coming near his destination. We read of how Jesus came from the east, walking up from Jericho and how he entered Jerusalem. He must have been tired. It was an intense climb from 825 feet below sea level all the way up to Jerusalem at two and a half thousand feet above sea level. And he gives his disciples specific instructions. He tells them exactly what to do. He says, go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it. Bring it here. There's no ambiguity. He doesn't say, oh, you know what, guys, my feet are getting tired. Do you reckon you could find me something to ride into Jerusalem on? And he enters Jerusalem and it's a busy city. It's got a a history of being a a key defensive stronghold, but but it's turning into maybe a more vulnerable, a more isolated place. And so uh, enter King Herod, who changed the focus of the city from defence and from logistics and water supplies into being a centre of the religious pilgrimage. Maybe it's because he was a good Jew or maybe it's because he knew that the tourist industry had a bit more money. But, but it's true that Jerusalem always had a temple that was popular, but this temple had been improved and Jerusalem was becoming more and more of a spectacular destination. It was a must-see tourist destination. But there was another part of the city as well. The lower city, a place of dirt and cleanliness, hunger and poverty with slums and room upon room. Dark alleyways in which the hardest Roman centurion uh, would avoid as well. No-go areas where losing your way might have meant losing your life. People here lived in despair. The ruling Pharisees, those Jews which like to make lots of rules to help people follow God, included purity laws, like having to avoid dead bodies or sewage. And those rules were impossible to follow in a place like the lower city in Jerusalem. You couldn't keep yourself clean. You couldn't keep the rules. So I wonder, people that lived in the lower part of this city of Jerusalem, As they heard the trumpet announcing the temple sacrifice, do you think they happily rushed the temple? Or do you think they looked around at each other and and remembered their dirt, their uncleanliness, the fact that they couldn't keep the rules and they realised they'd never be pure enough to enter the temple? And so into this city, into this place of, of great riches and forlorn despair, enters Jesus And he would have entered, we read on Palm Sunday, he would have entered past thousands of Jewish pilgrims who were camping outside the city. They couldn't afford to stay in the city. And as he rode past them, we read of clothes being put down in front of him. Other gospel accounts talk about palm leaves being thrown down. His followers shouting, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. I like to think that maybe the crowd was partly made up of those who have seen Jesus open blind eyes, set the oppressed free, cast out demons, heal the sick, turn lives around, as well maybe as as curious followers. People caught up in the celebration, people wondering what it's all about. I wonder this morning where you are. Where are you in the crowd that's following Jesus? Are you someone who's followed Jesus all your life? Have you seen him do amazing things? Maybe you're that part of the crowd. Or maybe this morning you've accidentally started this watching this video on YouTube or on Facebook and you don't know much about this Jesus, but there's something about him that's intriguing you. There's something about him that makes you want to follow him and get to know him better. Because in the gospel accounts, it seems that finally Jesus has been recognised, at least by some, as the Messiah, as the king. You see, throwing down cloaks was only ever done for royalty. 
It wasn't done even for people of, of esteemed uh, stature or for wide, wise older people. It was only done for people with royal blood. But why on earth would someone that royal come in on a donkey, come in on a colt? Especially one that hasn't even been broken in, hadn't even been trained. Well, our answer is in the Old Testament book of Zechariah. Chapter 9, verse 9, and we read it earlier. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you. Righteous, victorious, riding on a donkey. On the foal of a donkey. You see, these Jewish pilgrims would have understood exactly what was going on here. That he is Jesus, and here he is proclaiming himself as king of all. I wonder if we can maybe learn something from this crowd who, who both acknowledge him as king, but then shout it out from the rooftops. So we've got Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, entering in Jerusalem. But as so often, he's a topsy-turvy Messiah, a God who seems to do things the wrong way round. A grown man on an untrained donkey. I can imagine, you know, his, his feet dragging along the floor, the floor followed by this, this bunch of, of children and people shouting things out. Well, where are the trumpets? Where are the white, amazingly decorated horses? The shields, the foot soldiers? What about the flag leading the procession? The foot soldiers at the front pushing the riffraff out the way? Where is the imperial show of power? Because that was the way that Rome did it. That was the way that the Roman war machine did it and showed their power and might, their wealth, their privilege, their military strength. And they did it on the posh side of the city, thank you very much. Not the cheap riffraff bit where Jesus came in. And interestingly, on this very day that was happening, on one side of the city, Pontius Pilate was entering Jerusalem. The sunshine, you know, bouncing off the, the, his, his gleaming armour. The sound of footsteps pounding on the road. This whole procession showing military might, political strength. But on the other side, on the lower side of the city, you've got another king. You've got another king entering on a donkey too small for him, with people calling out that don't really understand what they're seeing or what they're saying. So on one side of the city, you've got a warmonger, on the other, a lover of peace. On one side, the military establishment with all its violence and, and love of power. And on the other side, a Messiah who commands us, turn the other cheek, love your enemy. And this topsy-turvy Messiah annoys the religious lot who ask him to quieten down, pipe down your disciples. And then, as Jesus continues, he starts weeping. He starts weeping as he enters the city, mourning the fact that his followers don't quite understand. And I wonder if we too, too often miss the point. I wonder if we too quickly forget that we worship a God who, who was, it seems, most at home at the lower end of the city. Most at home among the poor and the unclean. I wonder if too quickly we forget the meaning of the cry, Hosanna! which is maybe translated better as, I beg you to save, please deliver us. In our Western rich and safe society where the streets are peaceful, it's so easy to forget the kind of situation which Jesus rode into on a donkey. Into the streets of Jerusalem where the poor were too unclean to go into the temple, where politics and power were the order of the day, where worshipping the wrong way could get you killed. Into this situation rides the King of Kings and into the same streets this King of Kings rides today. He rides into situations of despair, of struggle, of tears. He rides into places where love is trampled underfoot by ruthless power. In areas where it seems there's no hope, rides the King of Kings. In area, areas that need freedom from fear, rides the King of Kings. In areas that need hope for the future and peace, rides Jesus Christ. But while this goes on, we still have other places where, like Pontius Pilate, politics and power are the order of the day. Where people follow a majestic, good-looking, awesome procession, forgetting, perhaps, that actually our king entered on the other side of the city. I wonder where that poor side of the city is today. Maybe in the current 
uh, pandemic. It's those families crammed into small homes, struggling to put food on the table, fearful of leaving, having lost their jobs, worried about where the next money is going to come from. Maybe it's the lonely neighbour who, who struggled to get, food, get to the local shop for their essential provisions at the best of times and now is really struggling. Maybe it's at the local food bank which is running out of food and running out of volunteers. Maybe it's those in society who are scared and fearful and who live in worry and despair of what the coronavirus might be doing. So I wonder what despair-filled places I could go to, we could go to, to show Jesus how to bring the kingdom. I wonder how we can take a stand against powers that would try and bring hate and division and instead sow the seeds of a gospel of love and peace. So the challenge for us, I challenge you, my friends, this morning to to maybe try and reenact a bit of Jesus's triumphal procession into Jerusalem. Maybe this week to endeavour to bring his light to the darkness, his love to the despairing. You might want to write a letter to your local MP. You might want to suggest to, um, to a neighbour that you could pray for them. If you're able to do so safely um, under the general guidelines, you might want to do some shopping for a neighbour in the name of Jesus that they might know that they are loved by the King of Kings. Whatever way we feel God might be prompting us, however silly it seems, let's pray together for obedience to usher God's kingdom in together. A kingdom that isn't seen in the shiny Roman armour, but in a, a kingdom that's seen in the, in the uh, ragamuffin bunch of children and people and clothes being thrown in front of a king on, who's on a donkey too small for him on the dodgy side of the city. So let's pray together. Let's pray. King Jesus, we declare you as King of Kings. And yet we know that you are not the King we expect sometimes. So help us, Father, to be a people who look out for your unexpected kingdom. Help us not to be um, conformed to the ways of the world, but to follow the King who rides a donkey. Holy Spirit, we give you time to speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen.
So we join together to declare our faith, uh, the faith that unites Christians around the world across different churches and traditions and denominations. We say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried, and he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. So we come to end with a time of prayer. And if you'd, I'd invite you to join in with the words in bold. I won't say them. I'll just leave a space for you to join in with them at home. So let's pray together. My friends, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us. O Lord, save the Queen. Endue thy ministers with righteousness. O Lord, save thy people. Give peace in our time, O Lord. O God, make clean our hearts within us. And I'll lead us through a short time of prayer. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life and whose, perfect is service, whose service is perfect freedom, defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defence, may not fear the power of any adversary through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy great might and power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings may be ordered by thy governance, to do always that which is righteous in thy sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And a moment of quiet to bring before the Lord either out loud in your home, or quietly in your heart, situations, uh, people, circumstances that you think the Holy Spirit is prompting you to pray for. Heavenly Father, you know those situations and those people that are on our hearts, so we pray that you would, by your Spirit, come close to those people that they would know that they are loved by you, that you have a plan for their lives, that they might know your peace and your comfort. And we pray together this prayer. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication unto thee, and has promised that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfil now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. Well, it's been really good to share with you this morning. If something I've said to you this morning, maybe you've come across this video uh, by coincidence or by mistake. If something I've said to you has, has prompted uh, more questions in your heart, please do get in touch. You can find our details at our website, allsaints-wellington.org. Uh, or on our YouTube channel, you can get in touch there as well. Do drop us a message, maybe on our Facebook page. We'd love to pray with you. Maybe you've never thought about Jesus. Maybe you've never given him a thought. Maybe you've never thought about a God who loves you, who died for you, who died to take away all your sin and present you faultless before the Father. Maybe that's a new thing for you and you'd like to hear more about it. Maybe you'd like to take a step towards knowing Jesus as your Lord, Saviour and friend. And if that's you this morning, we would love to pray with you. 
Anyway, my friends, it has been a pleasure to be with you. Uh, do stay in touch on our Facebook page or via email or on the phone. And let's say a blessing to close. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the king who came in on the dodgy side of the city, on a small donkey. You're a topsy-turvy king. And Lord, give us a portion of your spirit. May we know your peace, your presence and your power. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's been good to be with you, my friends. I will see you next time. God bless you. See you later. Bye bye.